This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion about President Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address. University of Kansas rhetoric and political communication professor Robert Rowland describes the use of language by President Ronald Reagan and the power it held in swaying the American people. Today we're talking about Reagan's first inaugural address, which is one of the most important speeches of the 20th century. Many people, the fact there was a group of experts, I was one of them, and they ranked Kennedy's inaugural as the greatest inaugural of the, of the century and the second best speech of the 20th century. I totally disagree with that. <laughs> two speeches, two inaugural addresses changed American politics in the 20th century. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first inaugural, which announced the New Deal, and Reagan's, which was a counterpoint to uh, FDR's great inaugural address. Reagan's speech has been recognized as a foundational statement of small government principled conservatism. So for example, shortly after the address, Business Week, commenting on the address, uh, the address said it was, it, they noted the administration's request for a major restructuring of government and highlighted Reagan's fundamentally conservative philosophy. The Economist made a very similar comment. That's a, ma- that's a magazine out of Great Britain. They made it clear that Reagan means to start transformation of America's fortunes with an attack on the federal budget. The Washington Post, the New York Times, all the major newspapers at the time noted the same thing. That this, re- this speech represented a major change in American politics away from government in, in, acting to solve problems toward less government, where what Reagan said was a way to address those problems. The speech is so important for conservatism pre Trump that the Heritage Foundation labeled it literally a foundational statement of American conservatism. Liberals have recognized exactly the same point. A famous liberal scholar, Alan Wolf, said that, Re- that Reagan seemed to be engaged in a direct dialogue with Franklin Roosevelt, where Roosevelt argued for more government, Reagan argued for less. A few le- years later, when, Ron- when Barack Obama was elected president, Peter Baker, writing in the New York Times, said that President Obama seemed to be in a direct dialogue with Ronald Reagan. That Obama was arguing for more government and responding to Reagan's famous comment that in this present crisis, government is the problem, government is not the solution. So you can draw a line between FDR in 1933 to uh, arguing for more government, the New Deal as the solution, to Ronald Reagan in 1981, and then to Barack Obama in 2008 responding to that. It is because of the importance of the ideas enunciated in this speech that there are two different books about the Reagan administration and Reagan's time, one by a very conservative scholar and one by a very liberal scholar that have the age of Reagan in their title. There's simply no question that beginning in 1980, there's an argument that Reagan had begun to get these ideas across to the nation before 1980, that what Reagan said in this inaugural address changed American politics and moved it in a different direction until Obama, and then again until Trump took a very different perspective. So, for example, writing in 2006, New York Times columnist, a conservative, David Brooks, argued that Reagan's view that less government equals more freedom, government is the problem, it became the organizing conservative principle of the day. Nicholas Lehman, who writes for the New Republic, talked about how Reagan's ideas became unassailable dominant in politics for, again, for nearly a generation. So we know that this speech is incredibly important because it was a foundational statement. And I want to give you one more source and a very unlikely one on the importance of Reagan's ideas. 
in the 2008 campaign, then Senator Barack Obama irritated the Clinton campaign massively when he noted that Reagan changed the trajectory of America in a way that Bill Clinton did not. He irritated the Clinton campaign most of all because it was quite clear that Obama was right, that Reagan changed things in a way that later Democratic presidents before Obama did not. What was it about Reagan that changed things? More than anything else, it was the force of his rhetoric. The, the great historian, Sean Wilentz, has said of Reagan that above all, Reagan and his supporters, unlike that what Reagan did was give his supporters and battered Democrats and the disgraced Republican establishment a compelling way to comprehend the disorienting and often dispiriting trends of the 1970s. Now, at this point, I've laid out the importance of Reagan's ideas, and I've laid out the importance of the speech. But there are two things that are puzzling about the speech. The first is that while Reagan defended small government conservatism consistently, those ideas were never particularly popular. Even before he was elected, let me give you the polling on whether the country wanted less government. The polling before Reagan was elected, in the four years before he was elected in 1980, said that the percentage of the people who thought that the government was spending either the right amount or too little on social programs was never less than 72%. And by May of 1981, just a few months into the Reagan administration, Andrew Kohut, the pollster, he had concluded that many people are either dubious or downright skeptical about the effectiveness of the president's approaches. George Edwards, a very famous political scientist, um, when I spoke about Reagan and his rhetoric at the Reagan Centennial, George Edwards was one of the people there who responded to what I have to say. But Edwards has made the point that Reagan was not very successful at changing the minds of the country about how much government we need. And Edwards has said that, he says, after an extensive analysis, when it came time to change public opinion or, and mobilize it on behalf, he typically met with failure. And he said once Reagan was in the White House, there was a movement away from conservative views. But when Reagan left the White House, he had 63% approval, 63% at the end of his administration. So one of the puzzling things in front of us is that Reagan's policies, in domestic policy at least, were never particularly popular. And over time, they became less popular. And yet Reagan himself and his broad ideas were all were very popular. Reagan won two landslide elections, and he left at 63%. It's impossible to imagine a contemporary president reaching 63% abs absent some kind of national crisis. The, the second part of the puzzle is that Reagan didn't succeed in downsizing government to any significant degree. He cut back on the size of the growth of government, but did not lead to major cuts. And again, I'm going to quote Sean Wilentz, who said that the number of government workers actually increased during Reagan's administration faster than during Jimmy Carter's. Total expenditures on social welfare programs, including Social Security and Medicare, rose between 1981 and 1989. This led some conservatives at the time to say that the Reagan revolution wasn't very revolutionary. So it is puzzling that there is universal agreement that Reagan's rhetoric was the single thing that made him most effective. There's also agreement that the years beginning with Reagan's election, it's 30 years of conservative dominance. It's the age of Reagan. But the domestic policies that were at the core of his administration were never very popular. 
And he did not succeed in achieving that kind of Reagan revol revolution. That's our setup for why we're so concerned with this inaugural address. Now, to be, we're going to, to begin to address that, we need to consider the particular situation in which Reagan became president. It was a very bad economic situation. Inflation reached 13.5% in 1980. Unemployment reached 7.5%. Reagan talked about the combination of those two statistics, what he called the misery index, which was over 20%. Interest rates also reached 20%. It was a time of perceived American weakness. American hostages had been held. They had been seized in Iran from the US Embassy, which had been overrun during the Iranian Revolution. The hostages were not were released during Reagan's inauguration. So it's a time, and it's a time when the Cold War was at one of its peaks. And in the 1980 election, for a time, the polling was very close between uh, then governor, former Governor Reagan and President Jimmy Carter. Many people expressed severe doubts about two things about Reagan. First, they thought he was just a, a movie actor and not a particularly good one. In other words, they didn't, he was, he was a mouthpiece and, and didn't know what he was saying. Now, that was totally false. I've spent a lot of time looking at Reagan's speech drafts where Reagan wrote things himself. But that is what people thought that. The other thing they thought about Reagan was that he was an extremist who might get us into a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. That was also false, as we now know. And I've also done a considerable work on Reagan's Soviet rhetoric. But knowing that those two things are false, the American people didn't know that then. And so Reagan only got a significant majority, of, he ends up in winning in a landslide after he has a debate with President Carter. And in the debate, President Reagan is extremely good throughout the debate in laying out and defending sensible positions. And I have argued that what Reagan did was persuade the American people that he was not a giant risk, that he could be an effective president. And, and that is something that actually then came to pass. So I've given you the particular situation. But inaugural addresses are also within a, a generic, a genre of inaugurals. And so inaugurals occur because we have a transition in power. And whenever you have that in a democratic society, we want to hear from the new person. And there are purposes that inaugurals have to fulfill if they're going to be good inaugurals. One of those purposes is that you have to tell people what, what the essence of your administration is going to be. A second purpose is to reunify the country. Because uh, elections are divisive now. The 1980 election was divisive and there was lots of conflict, but it was not, not like our recent elections that you've lived through, which are much, much more divisive. And finally, an inaugural address is a chance to create a kind of rhetorical oomph for the president's agenda. And scholars who have looked at those purposes and the societal constraints of an inaugural as an extremely formal situation, including me, have come up with seven things inaugurals, if they are to be effective, routinely need to do. And so I'm just going to state these seven things, and then I'm going to go through the Reagan inaugural and talk about how effectively he did those seven things. The first of the seven is to state the political principles of the administration. I, I mentioned earlier that this is a weakness in the Kennedy inaugural, which in all other ways is a terrific speech, but there are no political principles in the Kennedy inaugural for domestic policy. If you had to say one characteristic was the most important, I think it's this one. Secondly, the president is, has entered the election. When they ran for election, they were representative of a party. But becoming president, they're president of the American people. And that means it's important to reach out to people of all parties and your opponents and of the diversity of the American experience. You have to reunify the country. Third, inaugurals are 
they would fall within the category of epideictic, ceremonial speeches. And ceremonial speeches are about affirming or negating basic values. And inaugurals are the most important time that we can talk about the values of what it means to be an American, and President Reagan certainly did that. Fourth, inaugurals always tell us where we are in what might be thought of as the nation's story. Because there are always problems of the moment. And what we want is a president to tell us, here's where we've been and here's how we're going to get to a better tomorrow, placing us in that nation's story. Inaugurals should be presented in a formal and ceremonial style. This is not a time for informal talk. Uh, Sixth, inaugurals need to reassure our allies and warn our enemies. In the case of 1980, uh, Reagan needed to reassure our allies in NATO, also in, in the Pacific theater, that we would stand by them and send a message to the Soviet Union that the United States would remain tough but would seek peace. And if a president fails to send that message, it can lead to destabilizing foreign policy situations. It's just essential that presidents do that. And last, we want a president who comes across as a strong leader but not a vain leader. And that may have changed a little bit in American politics And uh, this was not an inaugural address, but this was his speech accepting the Republican nomination in 2016. Uh, uh, Then nominee Trump said that I alone can solve these problems. That would not have been something that any previous president would have said. The starting point for understanding why Reagan's message in general and this inaugural address in particular, were so incredibly effective and important, is to go through those seven and ask, what did Reagan say? The first, I said, is the most important. And there is, that's stating political principles. And there is one line that's quoted again and again and again from Reagan's inaugural. In fact, I quoted David Brooks as saying it a moment ago. I saw it quoted this way in the New York Times last week. Government is not the solution. Government is the problem. But that's not actually what Reagan said. What Reagan said is, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And I'm already beginning to hint at a reason that Reagan was much more effective than other conservatives. Because Reagan was a pragmatist as well as a principled conservative. In the talk I gave at the Reagan Centennial, I talk about Reagan as a principled conservative, but Reagan also as a pragmatist who adapted his policies to the moment. So a few minutes after Reagan made that principled call for less government, and and remember, that call is cited again and again as a first principle of conservatism. Reagan then went on to say, Now, so there will be no misunderstanding. It's not my intention to do away with government. It is rather to make it work, work with us, not over us, to stand by our side, not right on our back. Government can and must provide opportunity, not smother it, foster productivity, not stifle it. So Reagan consistently advocated for less government, less regulation, lower taxes, but not no government, not no regulation, not no taxes. And he also defended less government as pragmatically beneficial. And I'll explain later how different that is from most other movement conservatives. The second thing we need to look for is whether Reagan reunified the country. And Reagan did a very graceful thing, which is not surprising at all if you study Reagan the way I have. In the introduction, he reached out and thanked President Carter. He said, by your gracious cooperation in the transition process, you have shown a watching world that we are a united people pledged to maintaining a political system which guarantees individual liberty. And then he added, I thank you and your people for all your help in maintaining the continuity, which is the bulwark of the republic. 
it's just such a graceful thing to say to the then former president of the United States. But there was another large audience that Reagan needed to reach in order to reunify the country. Reagan had received the support of a very small percentage of non-white Americans. The percentage of black Americans who voted for him, and Hispanic Americans, other groups, is very small. And there were many who thought Reagan's just going to rule for the, the rich and the white. So Reagan makes a point of reaching out across America's diversity to say he's going to be president for everyone. He made a point of saying he spoke for all Americans, and I'm quoting, regardless of ethnic and racial divisions. And he talked about a domestic program that produced a healthy, vigorous, growing economy, any Republican would say that, that provides equal opportunities for all Americans with no barriers born of bigotry or discrimination. When I read that passage to students, they often assume it's a Democrat who said it. That was Reagan. He went on to say, we, we shall reflect the compassionate that is so much a part of your makeup. How can we love our country and not love our countrymen? And loving them, reach out a hand when they fall, heal them when they're sick, and provide an opportunity to make them self-sufficient so they will be equal in fact and not just in theory. Now, his policies, cutting back on government, they were, they were not good for many in the poor. And the poor have more from the minority groups than any other uh, percent by percentage. But his vision of America was one in which everybody counted because of who you were. And who you were was an American which was an idea, not about ethnic identity. And that's why when you find black or Hispanic Amer uh, Republicans of a certain age, they almost always have Ronald Reagan as their hero. Because he described an America which everybody, everybody could participate. He also did an eloquent job of restating values. Now, the most important value that he talked about was liberty. And he explained that he thought the United States had prospered as no other people on earth because freedom and dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. But liberty isn't enough by itself. Democrats often will focus on equality. Reagan took a slightly different approach. He focused on opportunity, reasoning that if we could make the American dream available to everyone, that that would provide the opportunity for everyone to succeed. For example, he said, ending inflation means freeing all Americans from the terror of runaway living costs. All must share in the productive work of this new beginning, and all must share in the bounty of a revised economy. You hear him saying again and again that his idea was for everyone. His policies didn't lead to that often on the domestic front, but his vision of America is an entirely colorblind vision in which American identity is defined by ideals. Place, place the nation in the story of, of, the, of their history. And remember, we're in a dark time. The combination of inflation and unemployment is over 20 percent. That's, you know, uh, Democrats had a tough time running in the, this midterm election, but it's nothing like what it was in 1980. And Reagan for, uh, focused on that early in the speech. He talked about how we face an economic affliction of greater proportions. He talked about the worst sustained inflation in our national history and unemployment that produces human misery and personal indignity. He talked about high taxes that penalize successful achievement and keep us from maintaining full productivity. But he has a very optimistic narrative. Now, the question is, how can he be optimistic at a point like that? And he talks about how they're going to check and reverse the growth of government, but normally, when we have high unemployment, we want government to step in and do something. And what Reagan is saying is that government needs to step back and also cut taxes. His answer is that Reagan thought the country could achieve great things 
not because of the government, but because of all of you. And I have two clips I want to show now from the inaugural. We hear much of special interest groups. Well, our concern must be for a special interest group that has been too long neglected. It knows no sectional boundaries or ethnic and racial divisions, and it crosses political party lines. It is made up of men and women who raise our food, patrol our streets, man our mines and factories, teach our children, keep our homes, and heal us when we're sick. Professionals, industrialists, shopkeepers, clerks, cabbies, and truck drivers. They are, in short, we the people. This breed called Americans. Well, this administration's objective will be a healthy, vigorous, growing economy that provides equal opportunities for all Americans with no barriers born of bigotry or discrimination. And now let me show a, another clip. We have, have every right to dream heroic dreams. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. You can see heroes every day going in and out of factory gates. Others, a handful in number, produce enough food to feed all of us and then the world beyond. You meet heroes across a counter, and they're on both sides of that counter. There are entrepreneurs with faith in themselves and faith in an idea who create new jobs, new wealth, and opportunity. They're individuals and families who take taxes, support the government, and whose voluntary gifts support church, charity, culture, art, and education. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. Now, I have used the words they and their in speaking of these heroes. I could say you and your because I'm addressing the heroes of whom I speak, you, the citizens of this blessed land. Your dreams, your hopes, your goals are going to be the dreams, the hopes, and the goals of this administration, so help me God. In Reagan's narrative, the nation would succeed not because of government, but because government would get out of the way of all of you. And notice when he describes professions. This is 1981. He would describe different professions today. But he does it in a way that's designed to include everyone in the country. That if we work hard, we can prosper. And he had a very optimistic vision of the future. But he, he was honest about it. We face difficult situations. He said, progress may be slow, measured in inches and feet, not miles, but we will progress. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant, to get government back within its means and lighten our punity of tax burdens, and these will be our first priorities, and on these principles there will be no compromise. And that's what he did. Whether you think it worked or not, that's what he did. The fifth characteristic, an inaugural should be presented in a formal and ceremonial style. <coughs> this speech does not have the eloquence of Kennedy or Lincoln, but what does have the eloquence of, of Lincoln. But Reagan has a particular gift for narrative and a particular gift for describing a nation that includes all of us. And I think that's a lot more important than the eloquence you find in the Kennedy inaugural at least. Reassure our allies and warn our enemies. We were at a time of grave danger in the Cold War. And he spoke directly to our allies in Europe, in Japan, Australia, around the world. To those neighbors and allies who share our freedom, we will strengthen our historic ties and assure them of our support and firm commitment. We will match loyalty with loyalty. There's a phrase in there I want to highlight. To those neighbors and allies who share our freedom. You see for Reagan that it's values that are always most important. And the values of our allies were that they believed in democracy too. 
He spoke to the Soviets as potential adversaries and first tried to lower the tensions. He said they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. He then went on to add that we will negotiate for it, sacrifice it, we will not surrender for it now or ever. But at the same time he's saying he's willing to negotiate and he's committed to peace, he forecasts the defense buildup that became the hallmark of his administration, especially the first term. He says, when action is required to preserve our national security, we will act. We will maintain sufficient strength to prevail, if need be, knowing that if, and this is the most important line, knowing that if we do so, we have the best chance of never having to use that strength. If we are strong, we won't have to fight. These passages guided his administration. I've written about, about Reagan's foreign policy and Soviet rhetoric. He had a build-up, but he really meant what he said about arms control negotiations. When liberals and conservatives heard Reagan talk about arms control, neither group believed it. Conservatives thought he has to say that. Liberals thought, oh, he doesn't mean it. In fact, he did mean it, as he demonstrated in his second term. But Reagan said something else in this speech that was really important about the Soviets. He said, above all, we must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. And what he meant was that ultimately the Cold War would be decided by ideas. And it was. Now, unfortunately, we've returned to the Cold War now. Uh, and, And we will see if that battle of ideas is as determinative as it was then. I, I think we have to hope that uh, America will always be, have as clear a foreign policy as President Reagan laid out. The last characteristic is the president should come across as a strong leader. I think in the passages I've already read, I've made it very clear that he did. Uh, when he promised progress and just said, and, and then when he promised that these will be the priorities of his administration, Reagan, he was not a detailed person on domestic policy. He was on Soviet policy. But, but Reagan did lay out very clear principles and stick to them. The question is why it didn't come across as arrogant. And the answer is that Reagan was not claiming credit for doing it himself. Rather, he was saying that all of you would do it. And I want to show one more passage And this is the conclusion of the speech. Standing here, one faces a magnificent vista, opening up on this city's special beauty and history. At the end of this open mall are those shrines to the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Directly in front of me, the monument to a monumental man, George Washington, father of our country. A man of humility who came to greatness reluctantly. He led America out of revolutionary victory into infant nationhood. Off to one side, the stately memorial to Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence flames with his eloquence. And then beyond the reflecting pool, the dignified columns of the Lincoln Memorial. Whoever would understand in his heart The meaning of America will find it in the life of Abraham Lincoln. Beyond those moments, those monuments to heroism, is the Potomac River, and on the far shore, the sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery, with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bellow Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Porkchop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man 
Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. The crisis we are facing today does not require of us the kind of sacrifice that Martin Treptow and so many thousands of others were called upon to make. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much. He's reminding us in the grave problems we faced in 1981 of the problems we've overcome before. The problems we face in 1981 are awful. Are they as bad as those that Washington and Jefferson faced? No. Are they as bad as Lincoln faced? Oh, no, no, no question. Lincoln, by consensus, the greatest American. And he's tapping into what's called American exceptionalism. It's the starting point of the American dream. Now, we need to recognize, we, we see much more clearly today than we did in 1981, the grave flaws in Washington and Jefferson about race. Grave flaws. But the words Jefferson wrote still matter. And Washington's courage, and especially the fact that Washington served two terms and then left the presidency. Though that matters too. The difficulty is in reminding us of American history, especially if you think about Lincoln, that if we have to be as good as Lincoln, well, then it's game over. And so he takes us to Arlington National Cemetery, and he talks about the people who sacrificed. Who is Martin Treptow? He's a small town barber. I, I often joke it's a useless profession. Martin Treptow is all of us. In a crisis, we stand for what we believe in. And if we do that, he says we will succeed because of the power of our ideas, our ideals. That's how Reagan can come across as a strong leader, but not a vain leader. You know, the irony is that he said something very, very similar to something that uh, President Obama did in accepting renomination in 2012. When asked why he was optimistic about America, Obama said, I'm optimistic because of you. And that's very similar to what Reagan said. The inaugural is just great. It does everything an inaugural is supposed to do. The seven characteristics, we went through all of them. He, he fulfills those characteristics. He does it in an engaging way. Uh, his, the style is not as good as Kennedy, but the content is, yeah, I, I'm a liberal Democrat, but the content is dramatic. And he, he established and reinforced small government conservatism for a generation, and he has a particular gift for narrative. The question, though, remains, why was it popular given that, over, that then, and over time even more so, the public didn't agree with him on cutting back the size of government. I think there are two answers to that. And the first part of the answer is that Reagan didn't so much win the argument about ideology as he won the narrative. In the passages that you've seen, 
Reagan gives us a variant of the American dream in which the hero is the individual. And if government gets out of the way of the individual, we can prosper. And especially at the, after 1983, the economy did come back. Now, many people attribute that more to the Federal Reserve than to President Reagan. But it seemed to verify everything that he said. In 1984, he ran for re-election under a, a, a slogan of it's morning again in America, that we were moving in the right direction. And that narrative of the, that government was too big and if government would get out of the way, we would achieve what we had always achieved. That was a powerful narrative then, and it is a powerful and empowering narrative now. That's one thing he did. The second thing that Reagan did, and I've written about both these things in, in academic journals, is that Reagan didn't talk like other conservatives. Conservatives tend to be dour in tone. When they talk about government, they talk about first principles. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase starving the beast. The beast is government. We have to cut back. It's a principle. We can't spend that money. That's not how Reagan talked. Reagan defended small government priorities. Less government, less regulation. Not no government, not no regulation but he did it in optimistic tone. He talked about the pragmatic benefits of cutting back on government. That's the way liberals talk normally. They say, with this expansion of government, we can do this. With this expansion, we can help this group. But you see, Reagan does the opposite, but he doesn't focus it on individual groups. He focuses it on all of us. So what Reagan did, the, thing, the irony is, the thing that makes Reagan's ideology so dominant is that he talks more like a liberal than a conservative because he focuses on the pragmatic benefits of action. The two things that made Reagan so successful were his gift for narrative, his recasting of the American dream, away from a government-oriented version, a community-oriented version is what this really is, and toward an individualistic government, where if government gets out of the way that ordinary people can prosper and will go forward. I want to say, oh, and then secondly, to defending less government as pragmatically advantageous for people. It's not, we'd like to help you, but we can't afford it, and so you're stuck. In Reagan's vision, cutting back on government would help everyone, regardless of identity. And, and, and notice, unlike many in conservatives today, Trump conservatives today, there are no warnings of dangerous groups. There's one group Reagan's concerned with, the American people as a whole. And in his view... They're all heroes as long as they remain committed to their ideals. Now, again, the policies did not live up to that. But you understand why the ideals, the narrative, and the way he talked about them were so immensely appealing and remain so today. When you, when you look at the uh, traditional Republicans who have rejected the way that President Trump has taken the Republican Party, they're almost all just, they're, they're Reaganites. John Kasich, the former governor of Ohio, is perhaps the best single example of that. They're, because they believe in these principles. Now, I talked about the arc of American history earlier. And I, and I want to talk about why the arc changed and we moved back to a to the kind of vision of government that President Obama presented. There are a couple of reasons for that. If you think about it, in 1932, March 1933, when he gives the inaugural, President Roosevelt talks about the importance of a new deal for the American people. That's a community-oriented vision of the American people. Roosevelt wanted people to work hard, but government would do for the people what they could not do for themselves. Reagan says government's gotten too big. If we cut back on government, we can help all the people. But 
after, after 20-some years, that vision of America didn't work so well as a political theory anymore. Her, in Hurricane Katrina, it didn't seem like cutting back on government had worked out very well. The rich-poor gap had gotten huge. And in Iraq, we had seemed to see failure of an interventionistic foreign policy. And who was dying in Iraq and Afghanistan, aside from the Iraqis and the Afghanistanis? It was the militaries made up of working class people, largely. Um, and, and so it seemed like Reagan's ideas did not work very well. And in that point, Barack Obama, then a state senator from Illinois, talked to, said at the 2004 Democratic National Convention, he said, with just a slight change in our priorities, we could do more to help everyone. And then, and he is, as president, in a very important speech in Kansas, of all places, he talked about how we needed to that everybody needed to, to do their fair share and everyone needed to get a fair shot. And you see, you can stretch the, the narrative trajectory from FDR. Government can help us do what we cannot do for ourselves. To Reagan saying government's too big and the best way to help the people is to cut back on government. To the perceived failures of Reagan's views, setting the stage for President Obama, state senator and later President Obama, to to say with just a slight change in our perspective, we can help every American achieve the American dream. Notice that in terms of values, there's very little difference between FDR and Reagan and Obama. It's narrative and ideology where they are different. Ideology, more government versus less government, and in narrative, individualistic version of the American dream versus a community-oriented version of the American dream. At the end of Obama's presidency in the 2016, the nation took a, a sharp turn away from either of the ideas of President Obama or the ideas of President Reagan to a a worldview that I've also written about, which emphasizes dangerous others, and it emphasizes grievance. And it is the very antithesis of the worldview that President Reagan uh, talked about throughout his presidency. And the great question in American politics today for conservatives is, will the continued rightward movement be the nationalist populism with the the heroic leader uh, of President Trump, or will it be back to the small government conservatism of Ronald Reagan, where the hero is not the leader. The hero is all of you. What do you think? Uh, What what, what is it going to go? Well, thank you. I was asking a question about where, where you thought the Republican Party was going to go. It'll probably stay like in the Trump era for a long time. And then... Well, yeah, sorry. We, re- we recently saw this mid- midterm election, it seems like a few conservatives are... Uh, a few conservatives are uh, pushing away from Trump. Right. So... Mike DeWine's a Reagan Republican. Mike DeWine's had the, another governor of Ohio that seemed to be consecrated in Ohio. And Liz Cheney's are Liz Cheney and definitely a Reagan Republican. I would, as t- about as tough as President Reagan, too. It seems that a lot more politicians are becoming socially conscious. Uh, the, whole, the whole country is more socially conscious. And, and that's an absolutely great thing. Although, I think if Reagan were here, he'd say, we, we need to lift up all of us not because we're different, but because we're the same. And let's help the people who are in need, regardless of race or gender or anything else. He was not a hater. Something to be said for his optimistic vision. We could try living up to it. Anybody else? 
I think that it's going to take, I think that it's going to continue in the trajectory of um, what Trump has set up for the Republican Party until there's another great leader that rises like Reagan that knows how to use rhetoric and narrative in a way to speak to the American people without offending anybody and somewhat being able to change a little bit of their mindset to get them back to kind of where we were with Reagan. Yeah, I think that's such a smart comment that it, it depends mm -hmm. upon having someone with a vision and the chutzpah to stick to it. Uh, and it's, it's, not, it's less about charisma and more about ideas. Let me depress you by saying that in American rhetorical history, it's about once a generation, and then every 150 years you get a Lincoln or a King. Um, you know, but Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Reagan, Obama, and like I say, Lincoln, for, for the true saints, it's about every 150 years. So, um, and I think you're, some of, it may well be right that it takes someone with Reagan's level of authenticity and commitment and eloquence. And I, let me add one more thing about this. Reagan, uh, he was the best editor of his own speeches and would write first drafts sometimes. Uh, you know, he, the, the theory that Reagan was a mere actor, there's consensus among Reagan speechwriters that the best speechwriter Ronald Reagan ever had was Ronald Reagan. You know, when you have something to say, you don't delegate it to somebody else. Right? Do you think that Republicans are going to continue with the Trump, like, on the hero kind of candidates, or do you think they're going to go, or do you think that they're going to try and find a Reagan-style government or the hero kind of candidates? I, I, I think this country, uh, let me dodge that question slightly, I think this country needs a principled, less government party, a conservative party, and that if you had to imagine a principled small government leader, it would be Reagan. And we need a principled more government party. And so I hope we can get to a point where that happens again. And hating each other is not the answer. You know, criminals call out evil, yes. But lifting all of us up is the answer. And uh, they both said that, uh, Reagan and Obama. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>